Chapter One of the Mystery at Dark Cedars. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carrie Sherrock. The Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. Chapter One The House of Mystery. Be quiet, Silky. What's the matter with you? You don't usually bark like common dogs over nothing. The brown spaniel stopped under a maple tree and wagged his tail forlornly, looking pleadingly into his mistress's eyes, as if he were trying to tell her that he wasn't just making a fuss over nothing. Mary Louise Gay stooped over and patted his head. She was a pretty girl of sixteen, with dark hair and lovely brown eyes, and long lashes that would make an actress envious. "'I see what Silky means,' cried her companion, Jane Patterson, who lived next door to Mary Louise and was her inseparable chum. Look, Mary Lou, up in the tree, a kitten. Both girls gazed up at the leafy branches overhead and spied a tiny black kitten crying piteously. It had climbed up and couldn't get down. I'll get it, said Mary Louise. She swung herself lightly to the lowest branch, chinned herself, and climbed the tree. In another minute, she had rescued the kitten with her hands. Stretch on your tiptoes, Jane, she called to her chum, and see if I can hand it down to you. The other girl, who was much shorter and stockier than Mary Louise, did as she was told, but the distance was too great. I suppose I'll have to climb down with her in one hand, concluded Mary Louise. That's not so easy. Drop her over to that branch you swung up by, and I'll get her from there, suggested Jane. A moment later, Mary Louise was at her chum's side, stroking the little black kitten, now purring contentedly in Jane's arms. I wonder whose it is, she remarked. There isn't any house near except old Miss Grant's. Both girls turned and looked at the hill which rose at the right of the lonely road on which they had been walking. The house, a large drab plaster building, was barely visible through the dark cedars that surrounded it on all sides. A high, thick hedge, taller than an average-sized man, gave the place an even greater aspect of gloominess and seclusion. "'Maybe it is Miss Grant's kitten,' suggested Jane. "'Old maids are supposed to like cats, you know.' Mary Louise's brown eyes sparkled with anticipation. I hope it is, she exclaimed, and then we'll get a look inside of that house, because everybody says it's supposed to be haunted. Our colored laundress's little girl was walking past it one evening about dusk, and she heard the most terrible moan. She claims that two eyes, without any head or body, looked out through the hedge at her. She dropped her bundle and ran as fast as she could for home. You don't really believe there's anything, do you, Mary Lou? I don't know. There must be something queer about it. Maybe there's a crazy woman shut up in the tower. You've been reading Jane Eyre, haven't you, Jane? But there isn't any tower on the Grant house. Well, I guess Miss Grant is crazy enough herself. She dresses in styles of forty years ago. Did you ever see her? Yes, I've had a glimpse of her once or twice when I walked past here. She looks like the picture of the old maid on the old maid cards. It must be awful for that girl who lives with her. What girl? inquired Jane. A niece, I believe. She must be about our age. Her father and mother both died. She has to live with Miss Grant. They say the old lady treats her terribly, much worse than the two old servants she keeps. While this conversation was going on, the two girls, followed by Silky, were walking slowly up the hill towards the big hedge which surrounded the Grant place. Once inside the yard, it was almost like being in a deep, thick woods. Cedar trees completely enclosed the house and grew thick on both sides of the narrow path leading from the gate to the porch. In spite of the fact that it was broad daylight, Jane found herself shuddering, but Mary Louise seemed delighted with the strange gloomy atmosphere. "'Doesn't this girl go to high school?' asked Jane. "'If she's about our age, I don't believe so. I never saw her there.' They stopped when they reached the steps of the porch and looked about with curiosity. It certainly was a run-down place. Boards were broken in the steps and pieces of plaster had crumbled from the outer wall. The grayish-colored ivy which grew over the house seemed to emphasize its aspect of the past. "'Isn't Miss Grant supposed to be rich?' whispered Jane incredulously. "'It doesn't look like it.' "'They say she's a miser, hoards every cent she can get,' Mary Louise smiled. "'I believe I'll tell Daddy to report her for hoarding. She deserves it.' "'Better wait and find out whether she really is rich, hadn't you?' returned Jane. "'Your father's a busy man.' Mary Louise nodded and looked at her dog. "'You lie down, Silky,' she commanded, "'and wait for us here. Miss Grant probably wouldn't like you. 
She might think you'd hurt pussy, she smiled indulgently. She doesn't know you belong to the Dog Scouts and do a kind act every day, like rescuing cats in distress. The Spaniel obeyed, and the two girls mounted the rickety steps of the porch. Although it was late in June, the door was closed tightly, and they had to pull a rusty knocker to let the people inside know that they were there. It was some minutes before there was any reply. A sad-faced girl in an old-fashioned purple calico dress finally opened the door and stared at them with big gray eyes. The length of her dress, the way her blonde hair was pulled back and pinned into a tight knot, made her seem much older than her visitors. A suggestion of a smile crossed her face at the sight of the girl's pleasant faces, and for a second she looked almost pretty. "'Is this your kitten?' asked Mary Louise. "'We rescued it from a tree down the road.' The girl nodded. "'Yes, it belongs to my Aunt Maddie. Come in, and I'll call her.' The girl stepped into the dark square hall and looked about them. The inside of the house was even more forbidding than the outside. The ceilings were high and the wallpaper dark. All the shutters were drawn, as if there were poison in the June sunlight. For no reason at all that they could see, the old stairs suddenly creaked. Jane shuddered visibly, and the girl in the purple dress smiled. "'Don't mind the queer noises,' she said. "'Nothing ever happens in the daytime.' "'Then something does happen after dark?' questioned Mary Louise eagerly. "'Oh, yes. Why, only two nights ago—' "'What's this? What's this?' demanded the sharp, high voice of an old woman. What are you standing there talking about, Elsie, with all those peaches waiting to be pared? All eyes turned naturally towards the old staircase, from which the sound of the voice was coming. Miss Grant slowly descended, holding her hand on her right side and grunting to herself, as if the act of walking were painful to her. She was a woman of at least sixty-five, thin and wrinkled, but with little sharp black beady eyes that seemed to peer into everything suspiciously, as if she believed the whole world evil. She was wearing an old-fashioned black dress and a dark shawl about her shoulders. "'These girls have found your kitten, Aunt Maddie,' Elsie informed her. "'They rescued her from a tree.' The black eyes softened, and the old woman came towards the girls. "'My precious little Puffy!' she exclaimed, as one might talk to a baby. Then her tone abruptly became harsh again as she turned to her niece. "'Go back to your work, Elsie,' she ordered gruffly. "'I'll attend to this.' Without any reply, the girl slunk away to the kitchen, and Miss Grant took the kitten from Jane. "'Tell me what happened to my poor little pet,' she said. Briefly, Jane repeated the story, with an emphasis upon Mary Louise's prowess in climbing trees. Apparently, the old lady was touched. "'I must say that was good of you,' she remarked. "'Not a bit like what most young people nowadays would do. All they seem to enjoy is torturing poor helpless creatures.' She put the kitten down on the floor and turned towards the stairs. "'You wait,' she commanded the girls. "'I'm going to get you a reward for this.' "'Oh, no, Miss Grant,' they both protested instantly, and Mary Louise went on to explain that they were Girl Scouts and never accepted money for good turns. "'Even Silky knows better than that,' she added to herself. "'He won't expect a bone for rescuing Pussy. "'Only a pat on the head.' "'You really mean that?' demanded Miss Grant, in obvious relief. "'She would have saved two cents. "'She had meant to give each girl a whole penny. "'Tell me your names, then.' she continued, and where you live. I might want to call on you for help sometime. I can't trust my niece as far as my nose, and my servants are both old. Mary Louise chuckled. So there was a mystery in this house, a lurking danger that Miss Grant and her niece both feared, and she and Jane were being drawn into it. Jane Patterson and Mary Louise Gay, she replied. We live over in Riverside next to the high school. You can get us on the phone. I don't have a telephone. Too expensive. Besides, if I had one, I couldn't tell what deviltry Elsie might be up to. No, I don't hold with these modern inventions. Well, you could send Elsie for us if you need any help, suggested Jane. It's only a little over a mile. You see, Mary Louise's father is a detective on the police force, and we're both interested in mysteries. I'm not thinking of any mystery, snapped Miss Grant. What I'm thinking of is facts. One fact is that I've got a pack of scheming relations who are trying to send me off to the hospital for an operation while they loot my house. Mary Louise's forehead wrinkled in surprise. I didn't know you had any relations beside your niece, she said. Certainly I have. Haven't you ever heard of the Grants in Riverside? Mrs. Grace Grant, a woman about my age? She has two grown sons and a married daughter. Well, they spent all their money and now they want mine, but they're not going to get it. Her hand went to her side again, as if she were in pain, and Mary Louise decided it was time for them to go. "'Well, goodbye, Miss Grant,' she said, 
And don't forget to call on us if you want help. It was a relief to be out in the bright sunlight again, away from the gloom and the decay of that ugly house. Mary Louise took a deep breath and whistled for Silky. He was waiting at the foot of the porch steps. As they walked down the path, they were startled by a rustle in one of the cedar trees. Silky perked up his ears and went to investigate the disturbance. In another moment, a head peered cautiously through the branches. It was Elsie Grant. "'Will you come over here and talk to me a little while?' she whispered, as if she were afraid of being caught. "'I never see any girls my own age, and you look so nice.' Both Mary Louise and Jane were touched by the loneliness of this poor, unhappy orphan. They went gladly to her side. "'Don't you go to school?' asked Mary Louise. "'I mean, when it isn't vacation time?' The girl shook her head. "'That must be awful!' exclaimed Jane. "'Sometimes I hate school, but I'd certainly hate worse never to go. How old are you?' "'I'm only fifteen, replied Elsie. "'But it seems as if I were fifty. I mean, the time is so long. Yet I've really only lived here with Aunt Mattie two years.' "'And didn't you ever go to school?' questioned Mary Louise. She couldn't believe that for the girl spoke beautiful English. Oh, yes, before I came here. I was just ready to enter high school when my mother died. Only a couple months after my father was killed in an accident, he was Aunt Mattie's youngest brother, and he didn't leave any money, so I had to come and live with her. But I can't see why she doesn't send you to school, protested Jane. It's a public high school. It wouldn't cost her anything. Yes, it would, because I haven't any clothes except these old things of hers. I can't go anywhere. I'm too ashamed. Mary Louise's eyes gleamed with indignation. That's terrible, she cried. We can report her. Elsie shook her head. No, you couldn't, because she feeds me well enough and gives me clothing that is clean and warm enough in winter. No, there isn't a thing anybody can do, except wait until I'm old enough to work in somebody's kitchen. No, protested Jane. But I thought if I could just see you two girls once in a while and talk to you, life wouldn't seem so bad if I could call you by your first names. Of course you can, Mary Louise assured her, and she told Elsie their names. We'll come over often, and I don't believe your aunt will object, because she seems to like us. She loves that kitten, explained Elsie. It's the only thing in the world she does love, besides money. She mentioned her money, remarked Jane, and told us that she believed her relatives were trying to get it away from her. By the way, said Mary Louise, you started to tell us about something that happened here two nights ago. Remember? What was it? Elsie shivered, as though the memory of it were still painful to her. I sleep up in the attic all by myself, and I hear the most awful noises at night. I'm always scared to death to go to bed. Don't the servants sleep there too? asked Mary Louise. She was anxious to get her facts straight from the beginning. No, they sleep on the second floor, in a room over the kitchen. There are just two of them, an old married couple named Hannah and William Grobin. Well, night before last, I heard more distinct noises than ever. First I thought it was one of the trees near my window, and I nerved myself to get out of bed and look out. And what do you think I saw? A ghost, whispered Jane, in awe. No, I don't think so. I believe it was a human being. Anyway, all I saw was two bright eyes peering in at the window. What did you do? demanded Mary Louise breathlessly. Scream? No, I didn't. Once before I screamed, and Aunt Mattie had William investigate everything, and when he found nobody, I was punished for my foolishness. I had to eat bread and water for two days, and it taught me a lesson. I never screamed again. Then what happened? I think whoever it was climbed from the tree into the attic storeroom window and went through an old trunk in there. I heard a little noise, but I couldn't tell whether it was only the wind or not. Anyway, Nothing was known about it till yesterday, when Aunt Mattie went up to look for something in her trunk. Did you tell her then? I tried to, but she wouldn't listen. She accused me of going through her trunk, but I wasn't punished because nothing was stolen. Then it couldn't have been a robber, said Mary Louise, or something would have been taken. Wasn't there anything else in the house missing? Not a thing. Hannah even counted the silver and found it was all there. How does Hannah account for it? Or does she think, like your aunt, that you did it? questioned Mary Louise. Hannah says it was spirits. She says the spirits can't rest as long as their old things are around. She wants Aunt Mattie to burn or give away all the old clothing in the house. She says dead people's clothes are possessed. Jane let out a peal of laughter, but Mary Louise warned her to be quiet. We mustn't get Elsie into trouble, she explained. 
Was that the only time anything like that ever happened? asked Jane. No. Once, earlier in the spring, when Hannah and William were away at some lodge supper, their room was entered and searched. I was blamed and punished then, though nothing was missing that time either. But the awful part of it is, I expect it to happen again every night. Every time the wind howls or a branch beats against a window pane, I'm sure they're coming again, whoever they are. And I'm afraid. Something's got to be done, announced Mary Louise with determination. I'm not my father's daughter if I allow a mysterious outrage like this to go on. She pressed Elsie's hand. You can count on us, she concluded. We'll be back to see you tomorrow. End of chapter one. Chapter Two of the Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Robbery. The house in which Mary Louise's father lived was as different from the Grants as night is from day. It was painted white, and its smooth green lawn was dotted here and there with bright flower beds, modern, airy, and filled with sunshine. The house itself looked like the home of a happy family, which the gays were as their name implied. Mary Louise's young brother, always called Freckles, was setting the breakfast table when she came downstairs the morning after her visit to Dark Cedars. It was Mary Louise's task to put the bedding to air while her mother cooked breakfast. Mrs. Gay did not keep a maid, and both children did their share of work. As they sat down to breakfast, Mary Louise could not help contrasting her life with poor Elsie Grant's, thinking how different, how cheerful everything was here, though... Of course, it was never quite the same when her father was away on a case, as so happened at the present time. Mary Louise wanted to do something to help Elsie, besides just visiting her. She had a sudden inspiration. "'I have a lot of clothes, haven't I, mother?' she inquired as she spread marmalade on her toast. Mrs. Gay smiled. She was a pretty woman, with the same dark hair and dark eyes as her daughter. "'I wouldn't say that, dear,' she replied. "'I think you have enough. But if there's something you specially want... I guess you can have it. Is that why you ask? No, replied Mary Louise laughingly. It's just the other way around. Instead of buying more, what I want to do is give some away. A couple of dresses, perhaps, and some lingerie, and a pair of slippers. Mrs. Gay nodded approvingly. Being both a neat housekeeper and a charitable woman, she loved to clear things out, and if possible, give them to someone who could use them. Yes, she said. I was thinking of making up a package to send to the Salvation Army today. That old blue sweater of yours could go, and the red woolen dress. No, no, interrupted Mary Louise. I didn't mean things like that, mother. I want to give away a couple of nice dresses, like my green flowered silk, for instance, and my pink linen. May I? Why, Mary Louise, I thought you especially liked those dresses. What's the matter with them? Nothing. I do like them a lot. That's why I chose them. I want to give them to a girl who hasn't had a new dress for over two years. Who is she? asked Mrs. Gay sympathetically. A niece of old Miss Grant, you know, that queer old maid who lives at Dark Cedars, about a mile out of town. Her mother nodded. Yes, I know where you mean, dear, but that woman is reputed to be rich, much better off than we are. I can't understand. Of course you can't, mother, unless you see poor Elsie Grant. She's about my age, a year younger to be exact, and she's an orphan. Two years ago, when her mother died, she came to live with Miss Grant because she hadn't anywhere to go and no money. And the old lady treats her shamefully. Dresses her in those old calico dresses that servants used to wear years ago. So Elsie can't go anywhere, not even to school. Mrs. Gay's lips closed tightly and her eyes narrowed. So that's the kind of woman Miss Grant is, she muttered. I always knew she was queer, but I never thought she was cruel. Yes, of course you can give the girl some clothing, dear. Go pick out anything you want, except those brand new things we bought last week for our trip in August. Mary Louise lost no time in making her selection. She piled the clothing on her bed, after she had put her room in order, and called her mother in for her approval. But before tying up the package, she whistled for Jane from the window. Her chum came running across the grass that grew between the two houses and bounded up the steps. Briefly, Mary Louise explained what she was doing. "'But I want to give Elsie something, too,' Jane said. "'She ought to have some kind of summer coat and a hat. Wait till I ask mother.' She returned in less than five minutes, bringing a lovely white wool coat and a white felt hat to match it. Mary Louise tied up the bundle. "'Please ask Freckles to take care of Silky this morning, mother,' she said. "'I'm afraid that perhaps Miss Grant might not like him.' 
the girls started off immediately through the streets of Riverside to the lonely road that led to Dark Cedars. "'I sort of wish we had Silky with us,' observed Jane as they approached the house. "'He is a protection.' Mary Louise laughed. "'But there isn't anything to protect us from. Elsie said nothing ever happened in the daytime.' A stifled sob coming from under the cedar trees caused the girls to stop abruptly and peer in among the low branches. There, half concealed by the thick growth, sat Elsie Grant, crying bitterly. Mary Louise and Jane were beside her in a second. "'What's the matter, Elsie?' demanded Mary Louise. "'What happened?' The girl raised her tear-stained face and attempted to smile, for Mary Louise and Jane came nearest to being her friends of all the people in the world. "'Aunt Mattie has been robbed,' she said. And everybody thinks I did it. You, cried Jane. Oh, how awful. The girl sat down on the ground beside her and asked her to tell them all about it. The bundle of clothing was forgotten for the time being in this new overwhelming catastrophe. My aunt has a big old safe in her room that she always keeps locked, Elsie began. She hasn't any faith in banks, she says, because they are always closing, so all her money is in this safe. I've often heard Aunt Grace try to make Aunt Mattie stop hoarding, but Aunt Mattie always refuses. She loves to have it where she can see it and count it. A regular miser, remarked Jane. Yes, it's her one joy in life, besides the little kitten. Every morning after breakfast, she opens that safe and counts her money over again. Doesn't she ever spend any? asked Mary Louise. A little, of course. She pays William and Hannah a small amount, and she buys some food, especially in the winter. But we have a garden, you know, and chickens and a cow. When did she miss this money? This morning. It was there yesterday. Aunt Mattie counted it right after you girls went home. You can hear her say the figures out loud and sort of chuckle to herself. But today she just let out a scream. It was horrible. I thought she was dying. Maybe it was taken last night, said Mary Louise. Did you hear any of those queer noises? I mean, the kind you heard before when you thought somebody searched that old trunk in the attic? No. I didn't. That's the worst part. Nobody else heard anything either all night long, and no door locks were broken. Of course, a burglar might have entered over the front porch roof through Aunt Mattie's window, but she's a light sleeper, and she says she never heard a sound. So of course she claims you stole it. Elsie nodded and started to cry again. But I didn't. I give you my word, I didn't. Of course you didn't, Elsie. We believe you. Aunt Mattie did everything but torture me to get a confession out of me. She said if I didn't own up to it and give it back, she'd send me to a reform school and I'd be branded as a criminal for the rest of my life. She couldn't do that, exclaimed Mary Louise furiously. If she has no proof, I'll tell you what I'll do, Elsie. I'll put my father on the case when he comes home. He's a detective on the police force and he's just wonderful. He'll find the real thief. Elsie shook her head. No, I'm afraid you can't do that because Aunt Mattie distinctly said that she won't have the police meddling in this. She says that if I didn't steal the money, somebody else in the family did. What family? Aunt Grace's family. She's the Mrs. Grant, you know, who lives in Riverside. She has three grown-up children and one grandchild. Aunt Mattie says one of these relatives is guilty, if I'm not, and she'll find out herself without bringing shame upon the Grant name. Mary Louise groaned. The only thing I can see for us to do, then, is to be detectives ourselves. Jane and I will do all we can to help you, won't we, Jane? Her chum nodded. At least, if we don't have to get into any spookiness at night, she amended. Those mysterious sounds you told us about, Elsie? They may all have some connection with this robbery, announced Mary Louise, and I'd like to find out. Elsie looked doubtful. I only hope Aunt Mattie doesn't try the bread and water diet on me to get a confession. Really, you have no idea how awful that is till you try it. You just get crazy for some real food. You'd be almost willing to lie to get it, even if you knew the lie was going to hurt you. If she tries that, you let us know, cried Jane angrily, and we'll bring our parents right over here. All right, I will. Elsie seemed to find some relief in the promise. Elsie, said Mary Louise very seriously, tell me who you really think did steal the money. The girl considered the problem carefully. I believe it was somebody in Aunt Grace's family, she replied slowly, because they used to be rich, and now they are poor, and I think that if a burglar had entered the house, somebody, probably Aunt Mattie, would have waken up. Couldn't he have entered before your aunt went to bed? suggested Mary Louise. Maybe, but Aunt Mattie was on the front porch all evening, and she'd probably have heard him. 
All right, then, agreed Mary Louise. Let's drop the idea of the burglar for the time being. Let's hear about the family. Your Aunt Grace's family, I mean. She reached into her pocket and took out a pencil and notebook, which she had provided for the purpose of writing down any items of clothing that Elsie might particularly want. Instead of that, she would list the possible suspects, the way her father usually did when he was working on a murder case. Go ahead, she said. I'm ready now. Tell me how many brothers and sisters your Aunt Mattie had, and everything else you can. Aunt Mattie had only two brothers, and not any sisters at all. My father was one brother, and Aunt Grace's husband was the other. They're both dead. Then your Aunt Grace isn't your Aunt Mattie's real sister? inquired Jane. No, but Aunt Mattie seems to like her better than any of her blood relations, even if she is only a sister-in-law. She comes over here pretty often. Maybe she took the money. Elsie looked shocked. Not Aunt Grace. She's too religious, always going to church and talking about right and wrong. She even argued with Aunt Mattie to let me go to Sunday school, but Aunt Mattie wouldn't buy me a decent dress. At the mention of clothing, Jane reached for the package they had carried with them to Dark Cedars, but Mary Louise shook her head, signaling her to wait until Elsie had finished. Well, anyway, Aunt Mattie's father liked her better than her two brothers, and he promised to leave her his money if she wouldn't get married while he was alive, and she didn't, you know. I guess nobody ever asked her, remarked Jane bluntly. That's what my mother used to say agreed Elsie. She didn't like Aunt Mattie, and Aunt Mattie hated her, so it's no wonder I'm not welcome here. Mary Louise called Elsie back to her facts by tapping her pencil on her notebook. So far, I have only one relative written down, she said. That's your Aunt Grace. Please go on. As I told you, I think, Elsie continued immediately, Aunt Grace has three grown children, two boys and a girl. Names, please, commanded Mary Louise in her most practical tone. John Grant, Harry Grant, and Mrs. Ellen Grant Pearson. The daughter is married. How old are they? All about forty, I guess. I don't know. Middle-aged. No, I guess you wouldn't call Harry middle-aged. He's the youngest. Except, of course, the granddaughter, Mrs. Pearson's only child. She's a girl about eighteen or nineteen. What's her name? Corrine. Corrine Pearson. Is that everybody? asked Mary Louise. I mean, all the living relatives of Miss Mattie Grant? Yes. That's all. Mary Louise read her list aloud, just to make sure that she had gotten the names correctly and to impress them upon her own mind. Miss Grace Grant, aged about 65, sister-in-law of Miss Mattie. John Grant, middle-aged. Ellen Grant Pearson, middle-aged. Harry Grant, about 30. Corrine Pearson, about 19. But you forgot me, Elsie reminded her. No, we didn't forget you either replied Mary Louise with a smile. We've got something for you, in that package. Something to make you forget your troubles, added Jane. Some new clothes. The girl's eyes lighted up with joy. Honestly? Oh, that's wonderful. Let me see them. Mary Louise untied the package and held the things up for Elsie to look at. The girl's expression was one of positive rapture. A silk dress, in the latest style, and the kind of soft woolly coat she had always dreamed of possessing. A hat that was a real hat, not one of those outlandish sunbonnets her Aunt Mattie made her wear. Dainty lingerie and a pair of white shoes. Oh, it's too much, she cried. I couldn't take them. They're your best things, I know they are. And once again her eyes filled with tears. We have other nice clothes, Mary Louise assured her, and our mother said it was all right, so you must take them. We'd be hurt if you didn't. Honestly? The girl looked as if she could not believe there was so much goodness in the world. Absolutely. Now, don't you want to go in and try them on? I'll do it right here, said Elsie. These cedars are so thick that nobody can see me, and if I went into the house, they might not let me out again to show you. With trembling fingers, she pulled off her shoes and stockings and the old calico dress she was wearing and put on the silk slip and the green flowered dress, then the white stockings and the slippers, which fitted beautifully, and last of all, the coat. Her eyes were sparkling now, and her feet were taking little dancing steps of delight. Elsie Grant looked like a different person. Wonderful, cried Mary Louise and Jane in the same breath. Only, let me fix your hair, suggested the former. It's naturally curly, isn't it? But you have it drawn back so tightly you can scarcely see any waves. I'd like to wear it like yours, Mary Louise, replied the orphan wistfully. But it's too long, and I have no money for barbers or beauty parlors. We'll see what we can do next time we come, answered Mary Louise. But let's loosen it up a bit now, 
and put your knot down low on your neck so that the hat will fit. Deftly, she fluffed it out a little at the sides and pinned it in a modish style. Then she put the little white hat on Elsie's head at just the correct angle and stepped back to survey the transformed girl with pride. You're positively a knockout, Elsie, she exclaimed in delight. Take my word for it, you're going to be a big hit in Riverside, she chuckled to herself. We'll all lose our boyfriends when they see you. Oh, no, protested Elsie seriously. You are really beautiful, Mary Louise, and so clever and good, and so is Jane. Both girls smiled at Elsie's extravagant praise. Then Mary Louise turned back to her notebook. I'd like to hear more about yesterday, she said. Whether you think any of these five relatives had a chance to steal that money. They all had a chance, answered Elsie. They were all here, and all up in Aunt Maddie's room at some time or other during the day or evening. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Suspects Let's sit down again while you tell me every single thing that happened here yesterday, suggested Mary Louise. Elsie took off the white coat and folded it carefully. Then she removed her hat. But I can't sit down in this silk dress, she objected, and I don't want to take it off till I see myself in a mirror. I might not have another chance to put it on all day long. You can sit on the paper, advised Jane. That will protect it. Besides, the ground is dry and these needles are a covering. Very cautiously, Elsie seated herself and turned to Mary Louise, who had dropped down beside her on the ground. Begin when you got up in the morning, she said. That was about seven o'clock, replied Elsie. But really, that doesn't matter, because I'm sure Aunt Mattie counted her money after you girls brought the kitten back. I heard her, and she stayed in her room until after lunch. Does this safe have a combination lock? inquired Mary Louise. No, it doesn't. Just a key. John Grant suggested to Aunt Mattie that she have one put on, and she refused. She said people can guess at combinations of figures by twisting the handle around, but if she kept the key with her day and night, nobody could open the safe. But she got fooled. The lock was broken? Yes, but the door of the safe was closed, so she hadn't noticed it until she went to count her money this morning. Do you know how much was taken? No, I don't. Plenty, I guess. Only, there was one queer thing about it. The thief didn't take the bonds she kept in a special drawer. Overlooked them, probably, remarked Louise. Maybe. I don't know. Well, as I said, Aunt Mattie was in her room until lunchtime, and then she went out on the front porch. About two o'clock in the afternoon, Aunt Grace and her son John drove over. John Grant, repeated Mary Louise, consulting the list in her notebook. He's your Aunt Grace's oldest son? Yes, he's about forty, as I said. Fat and a little bald. An old bachelor. Probably you'd recognize him if you saw him, because he's on the school board. Aunt Mattie likes him because he does little repair jobs for her around the house that save her spending money for a carpenter. Yesterday he went upstairs and fixed a window sash in her bedroom. Elsie paused thoughtfully. So, you see, John had a good chance to open the safe and steal the money. Why, he's the guilty one, of course, cried Jane instantly. It's just too plain. I should think your aunt would see that. Elsie shook her head. No, it would never occur to Aunt Mattie to accuse John. He's the one person in the family she trusts. She always says she's leaving him all her money in her will, so why would he bother to steal it? He might need it now, for some particular purpose, replied Jane. He is handy with tools, you say, and had such a good opportunity. We better get on with the story, urged Mary Louise. Any minute Elsie may be called in. The girl shuddered, as if she dreaded the ordeal of meeting her aunt again. Was your aunt Grace in the bedroom at all during the afternoon? questioned Mary Louise. By herself, I mean. I don't know. She and Aunt Mattie went up together to look at the window after John finished fixing it, but whether or not Aunt Grace was there alone, I couldn't say. Anyhow, there's no use worrying about that. Aunt Grace just couldn't steal anything. According to the detective stories, put in Jane, it's the person who just couldn't commit the crime who always is the guilty one, the one you suspect least. But this isn't a story, said Elsie. I wish it were. If you knew how dreadful it is for me, living here and having everybody think I'm a thief. Why don't you run away, now that you have some decent clothes? suggested Jane. I just wouldn't stand for anything like that. But I have nowhere to go. 
Besides, running away would make me look guiltier than ever. Elsie's right, approved Mary Louise. She can't run away now, but we'll prove she's innocent, she added with determination. There's something else that happened during that visit, continued Elsie. I mean, while Aunt Grace and John were here, part of a conversation I overheard that may give you a clue. Aunt Grace said her youngest son, Harry, you remember, had gotten into debt and needed some money very badly. She didn't actually ask Aunt Mattie to help him out. She only hinted, but she didn't get any encouragement from Aunt Mattie. She told Aunt Grace just to shut Harry out of the house till he learned to behave himself. So this Harry Grant is in debt, muttered Mary Louise, making a note of this fact in her little book. Could he have stolen the money? Yes, it's possible. After Aunt Grace and John went home, Harry came over to Dark Cedars. What time was that? Around four o'clock, I think. I was out in the kitchen helping Hannah shell some peas for supper. We heard his car. It's a terribly noisy old thing. And then his voice. What's he like? asked Mary Louise. I told you he was the youngest of Aunt Grace's children, you know, and he's rather handsome. He treats me much better than any of the other relations, except Aunt Grace. But still, I don't like him. He always insists on kissing me and teasing me about imaginary boyfriends. I usually run out into the kitchen when I hear him coming. Is he here often? Only when he wants something. He tries to flatter Aunt Mattie and tease her money away from her, but, as far as I know, he never gets any. What did he want yesterday? He said he wanted a loan. He didn't bother to talk quietly. I could hear every word he said from the kitchen. And your aunt refused? Yes. She told him to sell his car if he needed money. As if he could sell that old bus, Elsie laughed. You'd have to pay somebody to take that away, she explained. Mary Louise tapped her pencil again. She hated to get away from the all-important subject. But how do you think Harry could have stolen the money if your Aunt Mattie was with him all the time? She asked. Aunt Mattie wasn't. He had a fine chance. Something had gone wrong with his car and he had to fix it on the way over. So his hands were all dirty and he went upstairs to wash them. Oh, exclaimed Jane significantly. Looks bad for Harry Grant, commented Mary Louise, because he had a motive. Daddy always looks for two things when he's solving a crime, the motive and the chance to get away with it. And it seems that this young man had both. Elsie nodded. Yes, he had, and he was upstairs a good while too. But then, he's an awful dandy about everything. You never see grease in Harry Grant's fingernails. Did he go right out when he came downstairs? inquired Mary Louise. No, he laughed and joked a lot. I heard him ask Aunt Mattie to lend him her fingernail rouge because he had forgotten his. Then he said he'd like some cookies, and I had to make lemonade. So, if he took the money, he must have had it in his pocket all this time. He didn't go upstairs again? No, he didn't. And I know Aunt Mattie had a good deal of it in gold, so it must have been terribly heavy. Still, men have a lot of pockets. Mary Louise nodded. Yes, that's true. But you'd think if he really had taken it, he'd have been anxious to get away. That story about asking for cookies and lemonade almost proves an alibi for him. She sighed. It was all getting rather complicated. Did anything else happen yesterday? She asked wearily. I mean, after Harry went home? Not till after supper. Then Mrs. Pearson and her daughter walked over to see Aunt Mattie. They used to be rich, but Mr. Pearson lost his job and they had to sell their car. So now they have to walk wherever they go. Jane let out a groan. So every one of those five relations of Miss Grant was here yesterday and had a chance to steal that money, she exclaimed. Yes, agreed Elsie. Every one of them. What are the Pearsons like? asked Mary Louise. Well, Mrs. Pearson looks like Aunt Grace. She's her daughter, you remember. But she isn't a bit like her. She isn't religious. In fact, she doesn't seem to care for anything in the world but that nasty daughter of hers. Corrine, you know? Have you ever seen Corrine Pearson? I think I have, replied Mary Louise. Though she never went to our school. I believe she attended that little private school, and now she goes around with the country club set, doesn't she? Yes. Her one ambition, and her mother's ambition for her, is to marry a rich man. I hate both of them. They're so rude to me. Never speak to me at all unless they give me a command as if I were a servant. Last night, Corrine told me to bring her a certain chair from the parlor because she thought our porch rockers were dirty, and the tone she used, as if I ought to keep them clean just for her. I always imagined she was like that, said Jane. I was introduced to her once, and when I passed her on the street the next day, she cut me dead. Once, she told me to untie her shoe and see if there was a stone in it, continued Elsie, in the haughtiest tone. 
I'd have slapped her foot, exclaimed Jane. You didn't obey her, did you? I had to. Aunt Mattie would have punished me if I didn't. She dislikes Corrine Pearson and her mother, but she hates me worst of all. So you can easily see why I run off when I see the Pearsons coming. I went back into the kitchen with Hannah, but Aunt Mattie soon called me to bring some ice water, and the conversation I heard may be another clue for you, Mary Louise. Oh, dear, sighed Jane. We've got too many clues already. A voice sounded from the house, making the girls pause for a moment in silence. Elsie, oh, Elsie. It's Hannah. I'll have to go in a minute, said the girl, carefully getting to her feet, not forgetting her new dress. But first, I must tell you about this conversation because it's important. It seems Corrine was invited to a very swell dance by one of those rich Mason boys, and she came over to ask Aunt Mattie for a new dress. Aunt Mattie laughed at her, that nasty cackle that she has. And then she said, Certainly I'll give you a dress, Corrine. Go up to my closet and pick out anything you want. You'll find some old party dresses there. Well, I could see that Corrine was furious, but she got up and went upstairs, and she did pick out an old lace gown. I thought maybe she was going to make it over. Perhaps she was just using it to hide the money, if she did steal it. Anyhow, she and her mother went home in a few minutes, carrying the dress with them. Mary Louise closed her notebook in confusion. You better run along now, Elsie, or you'll get punished, she advised. All right, I will, agreed the younger girl as she gathered up her things. You know all the suspects now. All but the servants, replied Mary Louise, and if I can... I'm going to interview Hannah immediately. End of chapter 3《Chapter 4 of The Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewing Hannah. Keeping under cover of the cedar trees, Mary Louise and Jane followed Elsie Grant at a discreet distance to the back of the house. Unlike the front entrance, there was a screen at the kitchen door, so the girls could hear Hannah's exclamation at the sight of the transformation in Elsie's appearance. "'My land!' she cried in amazement. "'Where did you get them clothes, Elsie?' Elsie laughed, the first normal girlish laugh that Mary Louise and Jane had ever heard from her. "'Don't I look nice, Hannah?' she asked. "'I haven't seen myself in a mirror, but I'm sure I do. I feel so different.' "'You look swell, all right,' agreed the servant. "'But no credit to you. "'If that's what you done with your aunt's money?' "'Oh, no, Hannah,' protested Elsie. "'You're wrong there. "'I didn't buy these things. "'They were given to me.' The two girls were standing at the screen door now, in full view, and Elsie beckoned for them to come inside. "'These are my friends, Hannah. "'The girls who rescued Aunt Mattie's kitten, remember? "'And they brought me the clothes this morning.' The woman shook her head. "'It might be true, but nobody'd believe it.' Folks don't give away nice things like that. I know that, for I've had a lot of hand-me-downs in my life. Besides, they fit you too good. But we did bring them to Elsie, asserted Jane. You can see that we're all about the same size, and we can prove it by our mothers. We'll bring them over. You'll do nothing of the kind, returned Hannah. Miss Mattie don't want a lot of strangers poking into her house and her affairs. Now you two run along. And Elsie, hurry up and get out of that finery. Look at them dishes waiting for you in the sink. The girl nodded and disappeared up the back stairs, humming a little tune to herself as she went. Mary Louise stood still. "'We want to ask you a question or two, Hannah,' she explained. "'We want to help find the thief who stole Miss Grant's money.' The woman's nose shot in the air, and a stubborn look came over her face. "'Is that so?' she asked defiantly. "'And what business is that of yourn?' "'We're making it our business,' replied Mary Louise patiently. "'Because we're fond of Elsie.' We think it's terrible for her to be accused of something she didn't do. How do you know she didn't do it? Why, we just know. That ain't no reason. Besides, what do you know about Elsie Grant? Seen her a couple of times and listened to her hard luck story and believe you know all about her? But surely you don't believe Elsie stole that money, demanded Jane. If she had, she'd certainly have run away immediately, wouldn't she? Maybe, if she had the spirit... But anyhow, it ain't none of your business, and Miss Mattie don't want it to get around. She don't want no scandal. Now, get along with you. Please, Hannah, begged Mary Louise. We'll promise not to tell anybody about the robbery, not even our mothers, if you just answer a couple of questions. The woman eyed her suspiciously. You think maybe I done it? she demanded. Well, I didn't. Miss Mattie knows how honest I am. William, too. 
that's me husband we've been in this house ever since miss mattie was a girl and the whole family knows they can trust us oh my goodness exclaimed mary louise i'm not suspecting you hannah all i want is a little information you're not going to the police and tell them what you know or to some detective no on my word of honor no jane and i are going to try and be detectives ourselves that's all for elsie's sake the woman's expression softened after all mary louise's brown eyes had a winning way all right only hurry up i got a lot of work to do mary louise smiled i'll be quick she promised i just want to know whether you think there was any time during the day or evening before miss grant went to bed when a burglar could have entered the house without being seen or heard hannah stopped beating the cake which she had been mixing while this conversation was taking place and gave the matter her entire consideration let me think she muttered not all morning for miss mattie was in her room herself not in the afternoon neither for there was too many people around all them relations come over and miss mattie was right on the front porch and i was here at the back no i don't see how anybody could have gotten in without being heard how about supper time questioned mary louise couldn't somebody have climbed in over the porch roof while the family were eating in the dining room it's possible answered hannah but it ain't likely burglars ain't usually as quiet as all that no i hold with miss mattie that elsie or maybe that good-for-nothing harry took the money mary louise sighed and turned towards the door i'm sure it wasn't elsie she said again but maybe you're right about mr harry grant i hope we find out by the way she added you couldn't tell me just how much was taken could you hannah no i couldn't miss mattie didn't say now my advice to you girls is forget all about it it ain't none of your affairs and elsie ain't a good companion for you young ladies she ain't had no education and probably now she's fifteen her aunt'll put her into service as a housemaid somewheres and you won't want to be associating with no servant girl jane's eyes blazed with indignation it's not fair she cried in a country like america where education is free anybody who wants it has a right to it then she can get it at night while she's working if she sets her mind to it remarked hannah complacently well hannah we thank you very much for your help concluded mary louise as she opened the screen door and you'll see us again neither girl said anything further until they were outside the big hedge that surrounded dark cedars both of them felt baffled by the conflicting information they had gathered i wish i could put the whole affair up to daddy observed mary louise as they descended the hill to the road he isn't home now but he soon will be well you can't replied her chum it might get elsie into trouble and besides we gave our promise it'll be hard not to talk about it oh dear if we only knew where and how to begin i guess the first thing to do is to find out just what was stolen said jane that will make it more definite at least we've heard that it was money but we don't know how much or what kind yes that's true and it would help considerably to know for instance if there was a lot of gold as elsie seems to think it would be practically impossible for harry grant to have concealed it in his pockets or for corinne pearson to have carried it back to riverside without any car but if on the other hand it was mostly paper money it would be no trick at all for either one of them to have made away with it the shrill screech of a loud horn attracted the girl's attention at that moment a familiar horn whose sound could not be mistaken it belonged on the roadster owned by max miller mary louise's special boyfriend in another second the bright green car flashed into view came up to the girls and stopped with a sudden jamming on of the brakes two hatless young men in flannel trousers and tennis shirts jumped out of the front seat what ho and hi and greetings cried max in delight where have you two been taking a walk answered mary louise calmly taking a walk repeated norman wilder the other young man who was usually at jane's elbow at parties and sports events you mean giving us the air giving you the air in what way jane's tone sounded severe but her eyes were smiling into norman's as if she were not at all sorry to see him forgot all about that tennis date we had didn't you demanded max is that a nice way to treat a couple of splendid fellows like ourselves he threw out his chest and pulled himself up to his full height which was six feet one mary louise gasped and looked conscience stricken we did forget she exclaimed but we can play now just as well as not at least if you'll take us home to get our shoes and rackets okay agreed max he turned to norman get into the rumble old man i crave to have mary louise beside me the car started forward with its customary sudden leap and max settled back in his seat 
We've got some great news for you, Mary Lou, he announced immediately. Big picnic on for this coming Saturday, rounding up the whole crowd. Mary Louise was not impressed. Picnics seemed tame to her in comparison with the excitement of being a detective and hunting down thieves. Afraid I have an engagement, she muttered. She and Jane had a special arrangement, by which every free hour of the day was pledged to the other, so that if either wanted to get out of an invitation, she could plead a previous date without actually telling a lie. "'The heck you have!' exclaimed Max in disappointment. "'You've got to break it!' "'Says you?' "'Yeah, says I. And you'll say so too, Mary Lou, when you hear more about this picnic. It's going to be different. We're driving across to Cooper's Woods.' "'Oh, I've been there,' yawned Mary Louise. There's nothing special there. Looks spooky and deep, but it's just an ordinary woods. Maybe a little wilder. Wait, you women never let a fellow talk. I've been trying to tell you something for five minutes, and here we are at your house and you haven't even heard it yet. I guess I shan't die. With a light laugh, she opened the car door and leaped out, at the exact moment that Jane and Norman jumped from the rumble, avoiding a collision by a fraction of an inch. Tell me about it when I come out again called Mary Louise to Max as she and Jane ran into their respective houses to change. Freckles met Mary Louise at the door. "'Can I go with you, sis?' he demanded. "'Yes, if you're ready,' she agreed, making a dash for the stairs. Her mother, meeting her in the hall, tried to detain her. She asked, "'Did the girl like the clothes, dear?' "'Oh, yes, she loved them,' replied Mary Louise. "'I'll tell you more about it when I get back from tennis. The boys are pestering us to hurry.' Three minutes later, both she and Jane were back in the car again, with Freckles and Silky added to the passenger list. Max immediately went on about the picnic, just as if he hadn't been interrupted at all. "'Here's the big news,' he said as he stepped on the starter. "'There are gypsies camping over in that meadow beside Cooper's Woods, so we're all going to have our fortunes told. That's why we're having the picnic there. Now, won't that be fun?' "'Yes, I guess so. But I really don't see how Jane and I can come.' She was interrupted by a tap on her shoulder from the rumble seat. "'I think we can break that date, Mary Lou,' announced her chum, with a wink. Mary Louise raised her eyebrows. "'Well, of course, if Jane thinks so,' she said to Max. "'It's as good as settled,' concluded Max, with a chuckle. But Mary Louise was not convinced, until she had a chance, after the game was over, to talk to Jane alone and to ask her why she wanted to go on the picnic when they had such important things to do. "'Because I had an inspiration,' replied Jane. "'One of us can ask the gypsy to solve our crime for us. "'They do tell strange things sometimes, you know, "'and they might lead us to the solution.'" End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Stolen Treasure "'I'm not just tired,' announced Jane Patterson, dropping into the hammock on Mary Louise's porch after the tennis was over. "'I'm completely exhausted. I don't believe I can even move as far as our house, let alone walk anywhere.' "'Oh, yes, you can,' replied Mary Louise. "'You'll feel lots better after you get a shower and some clean clothing. Four sets of tennis oughtn't to do you up. Many a time I've seen you good for six. "'I know, but they weren't so strenuous. Honestly, you and Max ran me ragged.' I tell you, Mary Lou, I'm all in, and I couldn't walk up that hill to Miss Grant's house if it meant life or death to me. But think of poor Elsie. She may need us now. Oh, what could we do? I don't know yet, but we have to go to find out just what was stolen, if for nothing else. She may know by this time. Then why not let the boys drive us up? asked Jane with a yawn. You know why. We can't let them into the secret. They tell everybody, and I bet... If the thing got out, Miss Grant would be so mad she'd have Elsie arrested then and there. No, there's nothing for us to do but walk, so please go get your shower. Wearily, Jane struggled to her feet. Okay, but I warn you, I may drop in my tracks, and then you'll have to carry me. I'll take that chance. Mary Louise met another protest from her mother, who tried to insist that her daughter lie down for a rest before supper, but here again persuasion won. Really, I'm not tired, mother, she explained. It's only that I'm hot and dirty, and we have something very important to do. I wish I could tell you all about it, but I can't now. Her mother seemed satisfied. She had learned by this time that she could trust Mary Louise. All right, dear, she said. Call Jane over, and you may all have some lemonade. Freckles said he had to have a cold drink. 
The refreshments revived even Jane, and half an hour later the two girls were walking up the shady lane which led towards the Grant place. It wasn't so bad as Jane had expected. The road was so sheltered by trees that they did not mind the climb. Once inside the hedge, they peered eagerly in among the cedar trees for a glimpse of Elsie, but they did not see her anywhere. "'She's probably in the kitchen helping Hannah with the dinner,' concluded Mary Louise. "'Let's go around back.' Here they found her, sitting on the back step, shelling peas. She was wearing her old dress again, and the girls could see that she had been crying. But her eyes lighted up with pleasure at the sight of her two friends. "'Oh, I'm so glad to see you girls,' she cried. "'I wanted you so much, and I didn't know how to let you know. "'You see, I don't even have your address, "'though that wouldn't have done me much good "'because I'm not allowed out of the gate, "'and I haven't any stamp to put on a letter. "'The only thing I could do was pray that you would come.' "'Well, here we are,' announced Mary Louise "'with a significant look at Jane. "'Now tell us why you specially wanted us. "'I wanted you to assure Aunt Mattie "'that you really did give me those dresses and things. "'Right away she said I must have bought them with her money.' though how she thinks I ever had a chance to get to any store is beyond me. She knows I never leave this place. How did she find out about them? inquired Mary Louise. You didn't show them to her, did you? No, I didn't. She found them while she was searching through my things this morning to see whether I had her money hidden anywhere. That's terrible, exclaimed Jane. Oh, how dreadful it must be to be all alone in the world without anybody who trusts you. Something of the same thought ran through Mary Louise's brain at the same time. "'Tell us just what has happened today, since we left,' urged Mary Louise. "'Has anybody been here?' "'No, not a soul. But Aunt Mattie put me through a lot more questions at lunch, and afterward she gave my room a thorough search. When she found my new clothes, she was more sure than ever that I was the thief. She told me if I didn't confess everything right away, she'd have to change her mind and call the police.' "'Did she call them?' demanded Jane." Not yet. It's lucky for me that she hasn't a telephone. She said she guessed she'd send William after supper, so you can see how much it meant for me for you girls to come over now. Mary Louise nodded gravely, and Jane blushed at her reluctance in wanting to come. If Elsie had gone to jail, it would have been their fault for giving her the clothing. When can we see your aunt? inquired Mary Louise. Right now. I'll go in and tell her. She's out on the front porch, I think. Elsie handed her pan to Hannah and went through the kitchen to the front of the house. She was back again in a moment, telling the girls to come with her. They found the old lady in her favorite rocking chair, with her knitting in her lap, but she was not working, just scowling at the world in general, and when Elsie came out on the dilapidated porch, an expression of pain crossed her wrinkled brows. Whether it was real pain from the trouble in her side, which she had mentioned, or whether it was only a miserly grief over the loss of her money, Mary Louise had no way of telling. "'Good afternoon, Miss Grant,' she said pleasantly. "'How is your kitten today?' A smile crept over the woman's face, making her much more pleasant to look at. "'She's fine,' she replied. "'Come here, Puffy, and speak to the kind girls who rescued you yesterday.' The kitten ran over and jumped into Miss Grant's lap. "'She certainly is sweet,' said Mary Louise. She cleared her throat. Why couldn't the old lady help her out by asking her a question about the clothing?' But Elsie, nervously impatient, brought up the subject they were all waiting for. "'Tell Aunt Mattie about the dresses and the coat,' she urged. "'Oh, yes,' said Mary Louise hastily. "'Your niece told us, Miss Grant, that she never gets to Riverside to buy any new clothes. So when I noticed we were all three about the same size, Jane and I asked our mothers whether we couldn't give her some of ours. They were willing, and so we brought them over this morning.' Hm was the only comment Miss Grant made to this explanation." Mary Louise could not tell whether she believed her or not, and whether she was pleased or angry. "'You didn't mind, did you, Miss Grant?' she inquired nervously. "'No, of course not. Elsie's mighty lucky. I only hope when she's working as somebody's maid that they'll be as nice to her. It helps out when wages are small, for nobody wants to pay servants much these days.' A lump came into Mary Louise's throat at the thought of Elsie's future, which Miss Grant had just pictured for them. She longed to plead the girl's cause, but she knew it would do no good, especially at the present time, with Miss Grant poorer than she had ever been in her life. The old lady's eyes suddenly narrowed, and she looked sharply at Mary Louise. "'See here,' she said abruptly. "'You two girls are the only people besides those living in this house who know about this robbery, and I don't want you to say a word of it to anybody. Understand? I don't want the police in on this until I'm ready to tell them, or my other relatives either. I expect to get that money back myself.' All three girls breathed a sigh of relief. 
it was evident that the police would not be summoned that evening, and both Mary Louise and Jane gave their promise of utmost secrecy. "'But we'd like to help discover the thief if we can,' added Mary Louise. "'You don't mind if we try, do you, Miss Grant? If it's all on the quiet?' "'No, I don't mind, but I don't see what you can do.' Miss Grant looked sharply at Elsie, as if she thought maybe her niece might confess to these girls while she stubbornly refused to tell her aunt anything. "'Yes,' she added. "'You might succeed where I failed. Yes, I'll pay ten dollars reward if you get my money back for me.' "'We think it might have been a robber,' remarked Mary Louise, to try to divert Miss Grant's suspicious eyes from her niece. "'He could have slipped in while you were at supper.' "'It wasn't a robber,' announced Miss Grant with conviction. "'If it had been, he'd have taken everything.' The most valuable things were left in the safe, my bonds. They're government bonds, too, so anybody could see the value of them, except a child. No, it was somebody right in this house. And she laughed with that nasty cackle, which made Jane so angry that, she said afterward, if Miss Grant hadn't been an old lady, she would have slapped her then and there in the face. Or maybe it was one of your other relations, said Mary Louise evenly. Possibly. I wouldn't trust Harry Grant or Corrine Pearson or Corrine's mother either, for that matter. How about Mrs. Grant? My sister-in-law? No, I don't think she'd take anything. And I know it wasn't John, or either of the servants. No. She looked at Elsie again. There's your culprit. Make her confess and you get ten dollars. She paused while everybody looked embarrassed, but she was enjoying the situation. I'll make it ten dollars apiece, she added. It isn't the money we want, Miss Grant, said Mary Louise stiffly. It's to clear Elsie of suspicion. Nonsense. Everybody wants money. Mary Louise took her notebook out of her pocket. Would you tell us just how much money was taken, Miss Grant? She asked. And all about it? Yes, of course I will. There was a metal box in the safe with five hundred dollars in gold. Gold? exclaimed Jane. I thought you were supposed to turn that into the government. You mind your business, snapped Miss Grant. We will, we will said Mary Louise hastily. Please go on, Miss Grant. Five hundred dollars in twenty-dollar gold pieces, she repeated. Then there was eight hundred and fifty dollars in bills, all in fifty-dollar notes. I have the numbers of the bills written down in a book upstairs. Would you like to copy them down, Mary Louise? Yes, indeed, cried the latter rapturously. Miss Grant was treating her just like a real detective. Come upstairs, then, with me, and you can see the safe in my room at the same time. The old lady turned to her niece, who was still waiting nervously beside the door. "'Go back to your work, Elsie,' she commanded. "'Hannah will be wanting you.' The girl nodded obediently, but before she disappeared, she softly asked Mary Louise, "'Will you and Jane be back again tomorrow?' "'Yes, of course,' was the reply. "'You can count on us.' Miss Grant gathered up her knitting and picked up her kitten from the porch floor, where it had been rolling about with a ball of its mistress's wool. I may want you girls to walk over to the bank with me tomorrow, she remarked, unless John happens to come here in his car. I've about decided to put my bonds into a safe deposit box at the bank. We'll be glad to go with you, Mary Louise assured her. The old lady struggled painfully to her feet and led the way through the house up the stairs to her room. Both girls noticed the ominous creak which these gave when anything touched them, and Jane shuddered. It must be awful to live in a tumble-down place like this. Miss Grant's room on the second floor was at the front of the house, just as Elsie had said, and one window overlooked the porch. It was furnished with ugly, heavy wooden furniture and a rug that was almost threadbare. Along one wall, opposite the bed, was a huge closet, in which, no doubt, Miss Grant kept those old dresses which she had offered to Corrine Pearson. And the most astonishing thing about the bedroom was the fact that it contained not a single mirror. But of course, Jane remarked afterward, you wouldn't want to see yourself if you looked like that old maid. Off in the corner was the iron safe, with the only comfortable chair in the room beside it. Here, evidently, Miss Grant spent most of her time, rocking in the old-fashioned chair and gloating over her money. Now she hobbled directly to the safe and opened the door for the girls to look into it. You can see how the lock has been picked, she pointed out. It's broken now, of course. She suddenly eyed the girls suspiciously, as if they were not to be trusted either, and added, the bonds aren't in there now. I hid them somewhere else. Mary Louise nodded solemnly. Yes, that was wise, Miss Grant. Now, may I write down the numbers of the bills that were stolen? After she had concluded this little task, she went to examine the windows. They were both large, plenty big enough for a person to step through without any difficulty. 
but the one over the porch proved disappointing for the roof of the porch was crumbling so badly and the posts were so rotted that anyone who attempted to climb in by that method would be taking his life in his hands i always keep that window locked said miss grant following mary louise so you see why i don't think it was a burglar who took my money locked day and night mary louise nodded and examined the other window it was high from the ground there was a tree growing near it but not near enough to make it possible for a human being to jump from a branch to the window sill only a monkey could perform a trick like that mary louise turned away with a sigh she was almost ready to admit that the robbery was an inside job as miss grant insisted may we see inside the closet before we go she asked as an afterthought miss grant nodded and opened the door disclosing a space as large as the kitchenettes in some of the modern apartments miss grant herself used it as a small storeroom for the things that she did not want to put up in the attic anybody could hide in here for hours jane remarked without being suffocated which is just what i believe elsie did returned miss grant with a smirk and the girls unhappy and more baffled than ever went home to their suppers End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of The Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Wild Ride. One of the best points in this case, Mary Louise observed in her most professional tone, is its secrecy. Why do you say that? questioned Jane. The girls were returning from their second visit that day to Dark Cedars and were walking as fast as they could towards home. It was almost six o'clock, and Mary Louise usually helped her mother a little with the supper. But Freckles was there. She knew he would offer his services. "'What I mean is, since the robbery hasn't been talked about, nobody is on guard,' she explained. "'If any of those relatives did take the money, probably they think the theft hasn't been discovered yet, or Miss Grant would have called them over to see her. In a way, it's pretty tricky of her.' "'But, do you know, I can hardly believe any of them stole all that gold,' returned Jane. "'Because what would they do with it?' nobody is supposed to use gold nowadays and it would arouse all sorts of suspicions yes that's true but then they might want to hoard it the same as miss grant did a man like harry grant wouldn't want to hoard any from what i hear of him he spends money before he even gets it true but there are other relatives and somebody did steal it yes somebody stole it all right only the fact that a lot of it was gold makes elsie look guilty she probably wouldn't know about the new law Mary Louise frowned. She didn't like that thought. Well, I'm not going to suspect Elsie till I've investigated everybody else. Every one of those five relations, Mrs. Grant, John Grant, Harry Grant, Mrs. Pearson, and her daughter Corrine. Have you any plan at all? inquired Jane. Yes, I'd like to do a little snooping tonight. Snooping? Where? How? Sneak around those two houses in Riverside. The Grants, where John and Harry live with their mother, and the Pearsons. It's such a warm evening, they'll probably be on their porches, and we might overhear something to our advantage. But suppose we were arrested for prowling? Oh, they wouldn't arrest two respectable-looking girls like us. Besides, if they did, Daddy could easily get us out. Is he home? No, he isn't, but he'll be back in a day or two. A day or two in the county jail wouldn't be so good. "'Nonsense, Jane. Nothing will happen,' Mary Louise assured her. "'We've got to take some chances if we're going to be detectives. Daddy takes terrible ones sometimes.' "'Do you know where these people live?' inquired her chum. "'The Grants and the Pearsons, I mean.' "'I know where the Grants live. In that big red brick house on Green Street. Old-fashioned, set back from the street. Don't you remember?' "'Yes, I guess I do. We can pass it on our way home if we go one block farther down before we turn in at our street.' how about the pearsons asked jane i don't know where they live but i think we can get the address from the phone book the girls stepped along at a rapid rate entirely forgetful of the tennis which had tired jane so completely a couple of hours ago in a minute or so they came in sight of the red brick house it was an ugly place but it was not run down or dilapidated like miss mattie grant's john grant evidently believed in keeping things in repair the house stood next to a vacant lot and it was enclosed by a wooden fence, which was overgrown with honeysuckle vines. A gravel drive led from the front to the backyard, alongside of this fence, and there were a half a dozen large old trees on the lawn. We could easily hide there after dark, 
muttered Mary Louise. Climb over that fence back by the garage and sneak up behind those trees to a spot within hearing distance of the porch. I don't see what good it would do us, objected Jane. It might do us lots of good. Look at that car. That must be Harry Grant's, judging from Elsie's description. If his car's there, he must be home. And if we hear him say anything about spending money, then we can be suspicious. Because where would he get the money unless he stole his aunt's? Jane nodded her head. Yes, I see your logic, she agreed. But there isn't a soul around now, and likely as not, there won't be all evening. They're probably eating supper. Come on, let's hurry and get ours over, and meet me as soon as you can afterwards. The girls separated at their gates, and Mary Louise ran inside quickly to be on hand to help her mother. "'Daddy isn't home yet?' she asked as she carried a plate of hot biscuits to the table. "'No, dear,' answered her mother. "'He's in Chicago. I had a special delivery letter from him today. He can't be back before the weekend, Saturday or Sunday.' Mary Louise sighed. She had been hoping that perhaps she could get some advice from him without giving away any names or places. Freckles dashed into the room with Silky close at his heels. "'Where have you been, sis?' he demanded. "'Why didn't you take Silky with you? He's been fussing for you.' "'Jane and I had an errand to go,' the girl explained. "'And we couldn't take him along, but we'll take him with us for a walk after supper.' "'Walk again?' repeated Mrs. Gay, her forehead wrinkled in disapproval. "'Mary Louise, you're doing too much. You must get some rest.' "'We shan't be out long, mother. It isn't a date or anything. Jane and I want to take a little stroll, with Silky, after supper.' Isn't it all right if I promise to go to bed very early? I suppose so, if you get in by 9.30. I promise, replied Mary Louise, little thinking how impossible it was going to be for her to keep her word. She did not start upon her project until she had finished washing the dishes for her mother. Then, slipping upstairs, she changed into a dark green sweater dress and brown shoes and stockings. Through the window of her bedroom, she signaled to her chum to make a similar change. "'Might as well make ourselves as inconspicuous as possible,' she explained as the two girls, followed by Silky, walked down the street ten minutes later. "'Did you have any trouble getting away, Jane? I mean, without giving any explanation?' "'Yes, a little. Mother can't understand all this sudden passion for walking, when I used to have to ride everywhere in Norman's or Max's car. I really think she believes I have a new boyfriend, and that I meet him somewhere so as not to make Norman jealous. As if I'd go to all that trouble!' Mary Louise nodded. A little jealousy does him good, she remarked. Of course, Mother doesn't think it's so queer for me, because I always did have to take Silky for walks, and he's a good excuse now. Oh, well, we'll be home early tonight, concluded Jane, so there won't be any cause for worry. There's somebody on the porch, several people, I think, said Mary Louise, as the girls turned onto the street on which the Grant's house was situated. Two men, added Jane as they came nearer. I think the person sitting down is a woman, but it's getting too dark to see clearly. All the better. That's just what we want. Let's cut across the lot to the back of the place and sneak up behind the car in the driveway. We can see the porch from there. But I'm afraid we'll be caught, objected Jane fearfully. Nevertheless, she followed Mary Louise around a side street to the rear of the lot, and together they climbed the Grant's fence, cautiously and silently. Once inside, they crept noiselessly along the grass near the fence until they came to the back of Harry Grant's car. There could be no doubt that it was his, at least five years old, with battered mudguards and rusted trimmings, it looked like the relic Elsie had laughed about. It was a small black coupe, with a compartment behind for carrying luggage. "'If Mr. Harry Grant goes for a ride in this, we're going with him,' announced Mary Louise. "'No,' cried her chum. "'How could we?' "'In the luggage compartment. "'We'd smother.' "'No, we wouldn't. We'd open the lid after we got started.' "'Suppose he locked us in?' "'He can't.' I just made sure that the lock has rusted off. But what good would it do us to ride with him? demanded Jane. Shh! They might hear us, warned Mary Louise. She turned to the dog and patted him. You keep quiet too, Silky. Why, she explained in a whisper, we could watch to see whether Mr. Harry spends any money. If he brings out a fifty-dollar bill, he's a doomed man. You are clever, Mary Lou, breathed her chum admiringly, but it's an awful risk to take. Oh, no, it isn't. Mr. Grant isn't a gangster or a desperate character. He wouldn't hurt us. Jane looked doubtful. Have you made out who the people are on the porch? She asked. It must be Mrs. Grace Grant and her two sons. Yes, and I feel sure that is Harry coming down the steps. Listen. The girl's eyes, more accustomed to the darkness, could distinguish the figures quite plainly by now. The younger of the two men, with a satchel in his hand, was speaking to his mother. 
I ought to be back by Saturday, he said in a loud, cheerful voice. And if this deal I've been talking about over in New York goes through, I'll be driving home in a new car. You better pay your debts first, Harry, cautioned his mother. I hope to make enough money to do both, he returned confidently. And if you see Aunt Mattie, you can tell her I don't need her help. Mary Louise nudged Jane's arm at this proud boast and repressed a giggle. Maybe he can fool his mother, she whispered, but he can't fool us. Come on, get in, Jane. Holding up the lid of the car's compartment, she lifted Silky in and gave her hand to her chum. Suppose he puts his satchel in here, said Jane, when they were all huddled down in the extremely small space, and Mary Louise had cautiously let down the lid, shutting them in absolute darkness. He won't, not if it has money in it. He'll keep it right on the seat beside him. He will anyway, because it doesn't take up much room. The car rocked to one side, indicating that Harry Grant had stepped in and was seating himself at the wheel. Jane's lip trembled. It's so dark in here, so terribly dark. Where's your hand, Mary Lou? Here, and here's Silky. Oh, Jane, this is going to be good. The motor started, and the car leaped forward with a sudden uneven bound. Jane repressed a cry of terror. It turned sharply at the gate and buzzed along noisily for several minutes before Mary Louise cautiously raised the lid and looked out. Oh, how good it was to see the lights again, and the sky, after that horrible blackness. The car had reached the open highway, which led out of Riverside, and it picked up speed until it was rattling along at a pace of about 60 miles an hour. Growing bolder, Mary Louise continued to raise the lid of the compartment until it was upright at its full height. The girls straightened up, with their heads and shoulders sticking out of the enclosure. "'Quite a nice ride after all, isn't it?' observed Mary Louise, gazing up at the stars. "'I don't know,' returned Jane. "'It sounds to me as if there were something wrong with that engine. If we have an accident—' That's just what I'm hoping for, was the surprising reply, or rather, a breakdown. Whatever would you do? I'll tell you. Listen carefully so we'll be prepared to act the minute the car stops. While Harry gets out on the left, he surely will because his wheel is on the left, we jump out on the right. If there are woods beside the road, as I remember there are for some distance along here, we disappear into them. If not, we get to the path and just walk along as if we were two people out for a walk with their dog. He won't think anything about that for he doesn't know us, or know that we came with him. "'But how will that help us find out whether he's the thief?' inquired Jane. "'My plan is to grab the satchel, if we get a chance, and run off with it.' "'But that's stealing, Mary Lou. He could have us arrested.' "'Detectives have to take chances like that. It isn't really stealing, for we want to get hold of it merely to give its contents to the rightful owner. Of course, if there's no money in it, we could return it later.' They were silent for a while, listening to the pounding of the engine. Fifteen minutes passed. Mary Louise saw by her watch when they rode under a light that it was quarter after nine and she recalled her promise to her mother. But she couldn't do anything about it now. They were ascending a hill and the speed of the car was diminishing. It seemed to the girls that they were not going to make it. The engine wheezed and puffed, but the driver was evidently doing his best. Ahead, on the left, shone the lights of a gas station, and this, Mary Louise decided, must be the goal that Harry was now aiming for. But the engine refused to go the full distance. It sputtered and died, and the girls felt the car jerked close to the right side, with no sign of civilization about except the lighted gas station about fifty yards ahead. But, lonely or not, the time had come for action, and there was not a second to be lost. Before Harry Grant's feet were off the running board, both girls were out of the car on the other side, holding Silky close to them and hiding in the shadow. Mr. Grant stepped forward and raised the hood of his motor, peering inside with a flashlight. Keeping her eye on him through the open window of the car, Mary Louise crept cautiously along the right side towards the front. The young man turned about suddenly and swore softly to himself, but it was not because he had seen or heard the girls, although Jane did not wait to find that out. Desperately frightened, she dashed wildly into the protecting darkness of the bushes at the side of the road. Mary Louise, however, remained steadfastly where she was, waiting for her opportunity. It came in another moment. Lighting a cigarette, Mr. Grant started to walk to the gas station. "'What could be sweeter?' exclaimed Mary Louise rapturously to herself, for Jane was out of hearing distance by this time. "'My big chance!' She reached her hand quickly through the open window and picked up the satchel from the seat. Then, with Silky close at her heels, she too made for the protecting woods. In another moment she was at Jane's side, breathless and triumphant. "'You're all right?' demanded her chum, exultantly. Oh, Mary Lou, you are marvelous. Not so marvelous as you think, replied the other, feeling for Jane's hand in the darkness. Lift that satchel. 
Jane groped about and took it from Mary Louise, expecting a heavy weight. But it was surprisingly, disappointingly light. It can't possibly contain any gold, said Mary Louise, dropping to the ground in disgust. All our trouble, and we're only a common pair of thieves ourselves. Silky came close to her and licked her hand reassuringly, as if he did not agree with her about the name she was calling herself and Jane. "'Stranded on a lonely road at least ten miles from home!' wailed Jane. "'Shh!' warned Mary Louise. "'They're at the car. Harry and another man. We might get caught.' But she stopped suddenly. Something was coming towards them, as they could sense from the snapping of a twig close by. Not from the road, however, but from the depth of the woods. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of the Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hands up. The two girls sat rigid with terror, Mary Louise holding tightly to Silky. In the darkness they could see nothing, for the denseness of the trees blotted even the sky from view. The silence of the woods was broken only by a faint rustle in the undergrowth, as something, they didn't know what, came nearer. Silky's ears were alert his body as tense with watching, and Jane was actually trembling. "'Got your flashlight, Mary Lou?' she whispered. "'Yes, but I'm afraid to put it on till Harry Grant gets away. He might see it from the road.' The sudden roar of the motor almost drowned out her words. The noise startled whatever it was that was near them, and the girls felt a little animal pass so close that it nearly touched them. They almost laughed out loud at their fear. The cause of their terror was only an innocent little white rabbit.' Mary Louise took a tighter grip upon her dog. "'You mustn't leave us, Silky. You don't want that bunny. We need you with us.' The engine continued to roar. The girls heard the car start and drive away. Jane uttered a sigh of relief. "'I wonder whether he missed his satchel,' she remarked. "'Probably he didn't care if he did,' returned her chum. "'I don't believe it has anything in it but a toothbrush and a change of linen. Let's open it and see.' Mary Louise turned on her flashlight and looked at the small brown bag beside them. "'Shucks,' she explained in disappointment. "'It's locked.' "'It would be. Well, so long as we have to carry it home, maybe we'll be glad that it's so light. "'I've got my penknife. I'm going to cut the leather. "'But, Mary Lou, it doesn't belong to us.' "'Can't help that. We'll buy Harry Grant a new one if he's innocent.' "'Okay, you're the boss, but careful not to cut yourself.' "'You hold the flashlight, Jane,' said Mary Louise, "'while I make the slit.' The operation was not so easy, for the leather was tough, but Mary Louise always kept her knife as sharp as a boy's, and she succeeded at last in making an opening. Excitedly, both girls peered into the bag, and Jane reached her hand into its depths. She drew it out again with an expression of disappointment. "'An old Turkish towel!' she exclaimed in dismay. But Mary Louise's search proved more fruitful. Her hand came upon a bulky paper wad, encircled by a rubber band. She drew her hand out quickly and flashed the light upon her find. It was a fat roll of money. The girls gazed at her discovery in speechless joy. It seemed more like a dream than reality, one of those strange dreams where you find money everywhere, in all sorts of queer, dark places. "'Hide it in your sweater, Mary Lou,' whispered Jane. "'Now let's make tracks for home.' Her companion concealed it carefully and then took another look into the satchel to make sure that none of the gold was there. She even inserted the flashlight into the bag to confirm her belief, but there was nothing more. Both girls got to their feet, Jane with the satchel still in her hands. "'I wish we were home,' she remarked after the flashlight had been turned off, making the darkness seem blacker than before. "'We can pick up a bus along this road, I think,' returned Mary Louise reassuringly. "'They ought to run along here about every half hour. "'Shall we use some of this money for car fare?' "'No, we don't have to. I have my purse with me.' Choosing their way carefully through the bushes and undergrowth, the two girls proceeded slowly towards the road, but their adventures in the wood were not over. They heard another rustle of twigs in front of them, and footsteps, human footsteps this time. "'Hands up!' snarled a gruff voice. The reactions of the two girls and the dog were instantaneous and utterly different. Jane clutched her chum's arm in terror. Mary Louise flashed her light upon the man, a rough, uncouth character, without even a mask, and Silky flew at his legs. The dog's bite was quick and sharp. The bully cried out in pain. Mary Louise chuckled and, pulling Jane by the hand, dashed out to the road towards the lights of the gas station in the distance. 
As the girls retreated, they could hear groans and swearing from their tormentor. When they slowed down across the road from the gas station, Mary Louise looked around and whistled for Silky. Jane, noticing that she still clutched the empty bag in her hand, hurled it as far as she could in the direction from which they had come. In another moment, the brave little dog came bounding to them. Mary Louise stooped over and picked him up in her arms. "'You wonderful Silky!' she cried as she led the way across the road. "'You saved our lives!' "'Suppose we hadn't taken him,' said Jane in horror. "'We'd be dead now.' "'Let's go ask the attendant about buses,' suggested Mary Louise, still stroking her dog's head. "'We better not,' cautioned Jane. "'He may suspect us if Harry Grant told him about his loss of the satchel.' "'Oh, no, he won't,' replied Mary Louise, "'because we'll tell him about the tramp, or the bandit, or whatever he is, and he'll suspect him.' They walked confidently up to the man inside the station. "'We are sort of lost,' announced Mary Louise. "'We want to get to Riverside. There was a tramp back there about fifty yards who tried to make trouble for us. Can we stay here until a bus comes along? They do run along here, don't they?' "'Yes, yeah, certainly,' replied the man, answering both questions at once. "'About fifty yards back, you say?' Did he have a brown satchel with him? I saw a brown satchel lying in the road, replied Mary Louise innocently. Why? Because a motorist stopped there a few minutes ago with engine trouble, and while he came to me for help, his grip was stolen. Did he have anything valuable in it? inquired Jane, trying to keep her tone casual. Yes, I believe there was about eight hundred dollars in it. Mary Louise gasped in delight. That meant that practically all of Miss Grant's paper money was there, in her sweater, all but one fifty-dollar bill. "'Well, I wouldn't go back there for eight thousand dollars,' said Jane. "'You can be sure there ain't any money in the bag now,' returned the attendant shrewdly. "'Here comes your bus. You're lucky. They only run every half hour. I'll go stop it for you.' Mary Louise kept Silky in her arms, and the two girls followed their protector to the middle of the road. The bus stopped, and the driver looked doubtfully at Silky. "'Don't allow no dogs,' he announced firmly. "'Oh, please!' begged Mary Louise in her sweetest tone. Silky is such a good, brave dog. He just saved our lives when we were held up by a highwayman, and we have to get home. Our mothers will be so worried. It's again the rules. Please let us this time. I'll hold him on my lap. Her brown eyes looked into his. For a moment, the man thought Mary Louise was going to cry. Then he turned to the half a dozen passengers in his car. I'll leave it up to yous. Would any of yous people report me if I let this here lady's dog in the bus? "'We'd report you if you didn't,' replied a good-natured woman with grey hair. "'These girls must get home as quickly as possible. "'It's not safe for them to be out on a lonely road like this at night.' "'Oh, thank you so much!' exclaimed Mary Louise, smiling radiantly at the kind woman. "'It's so good of you to help us out.' The door closed. The girls waved goodbye to the attendant, and the bus started. Mary Louise gazed dismally at her watch. "'Even now we'll be an hour late,' she remarked. We promised our mothers we'd be home by half-past nine. Girls your age shouldn't go lonely places after dark, observed the motherly woman. Let this be a lesson to you. Oh, it will be, we assure you, Jane told her. One experience like this is enough for us. The bus rumbled on for twenty minutes or so and finally deposited the girls in Riverside, half a block from their homes. Still have the money? whispered Jane as they ran the short distance to their gates. Yes, I can feel the wad here. I was so afraid somebody in the bus would notice it, but having Silky in my lap helped. It seems we have company, remarked Jane, recognizing a familiar roadster parked in front of their houses. Now, what can Max want at this time of night? demanded Mary Louise impatiently. She longed so terribly to get into her room by herself and count the money. Here they are, Mrs. Gay, called a masculine voice from the porch. They're all right, apparently. The two mothers appeared on Mary Louise's porch. "'What in the world happened?' demanded Mrs. Patterson. "'Mrs. Gay and I have been worried to death.' "'Not to mention us,' added Norman Wilder from the doorstep. "'We phoned all your friends, and nobody had seen a thing of you.' "'I wish we could tell you all about it,' answered Mary Louise slowly. "'But we aren't allowed to. "'All I can say is, it's something in connection with Elsie Grant, "'the orphan, you know, mother, whom we told you about?' Mrs. Gay looked relieved, but not entirely satisfied. "'I can't have you two girls going up that lonely road at night, dear,' she said. "'To the Grant's place, I mean. It isn't safe.' "'Oh, we weren't there tonight,' Jane assured her, not going on to explain that they had gone somewhere far more dangerous. "'Well, if you do have to go there, let Max or Norman drive you,' suggested Mrs. Patterson. "'The boys are willing, aren't you?' "'Sure thing,' 
they both replied. Let's all come inside and have some chocolate cake, said Mrs. Gay, delighted that everything had turned out all right. You girls must be hungry. They were, of course, but Mary Louise was more anxious to be alone to counter treasure than to eat. However, she could not refuse, and the party lasted until after eleven. Her mother followed her upstairs after the company had gone home. "'You must be tired, dear,' she said tenderly. "'Just step out of your clothes and I'll hang them up for you.' "'Oh, no thanks, mother. I'm not so tired. We rode home in the bus. Please don't bother. I'm all right.' "'Just as you say, dear,' agreed Mrs. Gay, kissing her daughter good night. "'But don't get up for breakfast. Try to get some sleep.' Mary Louise smiled. "'Not if I know it,' she thought to herself. "'I'm going after the rest of that treasure, the gold. "'Maybe if I get that back for Miss Grant, "'she'll consent to let Elsie go to high school in the fall.' "'Very carefully, she drew off her sweater "'and laid the bills under the pillow on her bed. "'Then, while she ran the shower in the bathroom, "'behind a locked door, "'she counted the money and checked the numbers "'engraved on the paper. "'The attendant was right. "'There were eight hundred dollars in all, in fifty-dollar notes.' and the best part about it was the fact that the numbers proved that the money belonged to Miss Mattie Grant. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of The Mystery at Dark Cedars » by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Confession It was a little after nine o'clock the following morning that Mary Louise and Jane set off for Dark Cedars. The money was safely hidden in Mary Louise's blouse, and Silky was told to come along for protection. "'I'll never leave him home again,' said Mary Louise. "'Miss Grant will have to get used to him. But when we tell her about last night, I guess she'll think he's a pretty wonderful dog.' "'I dreamed about bandits and robbers,' remarked Jane, with a shudder. "'No more night adventures for me.' "'Well, it was worth it, wasn't it? Think of the pleasure of clearing Elsie of suspicion.' "'It won't, though. Her aunt will insist that she took that gold.' "'We're going to get that back, too,' asserted Mary Louise confidently. "'By the way,' observed Jane, "'Norman tried to make me promise we drive over to the park with them this afternoon "'and have our supper there, after a swim. "'I said I'd let him know.' "'Mary Louise shook her head. "'We can't make dates, Jane. It's out of the question, "'for we don't know what may turn up. "'I want to investigate the Pearsons today. "'That disagreeable Corrine may have had a part in the theft. "'I'm sorry now that we promised the boys we'd go on that picnic.' "'That picnic's going to be fun. "'You know what marvellous swimming there is down by Cooper's Woods, "'and don't forget the gypsies. "'I love to have my fortune told.' "'Yes, that's fun, I admit. "'But a whole day? "'Oh, well, maybe we'll solve the whole crime today, "'and maybe Miss Grant will let us take Elsie with us, "'now that she has some nice dresses.' "'Mary Louise's eyes brightened. "'That is an idea, Jane. "'I'll ask Miss Grant today, "'as a reward for returning her money.' The increasing heat of the day and the steepness of the climb to Dark Cedars made the girls long for that swimming pool in the amusement park, and Jane at least wished that they were going with the boys. But one glance at her chum's determined face made her realize that such a hope was not to be fulfilled. Both girls felt hot and sticky when they finally mounted the porch steps at Dark Cedars and pulled the old-fashioned knocker on the wooden door. It was opened almost immediately by Hannah, who evidently had been working right there in the front of the house. The woman looked hot and disturbed, as if she had been working fast, under pressure. "'Good morning,' said Mary Louise brightly. "'May we see Miss Grant, Hannah?' "'I don't know,' replied the servant. "'She's all of a fluster. We're at sixes and sevens here this morning. The ghosts walked last night.' "'What ghosts?' asked Mary Louise, trying to repress a smile. "'You know. Elsie's told you about them. The spirits that wanders through this house at night, mussing up things. They had a party all over the downstairs last night.' Hannah, exclaimed Jane, you know that isn't possible. If there was a disturbance, it was caused by human beings. Burglars. The woman shook her head. You don't know nothing about it. If it was burglars, why wasn't something stolen? Wasn't anything stolen? demanded Mary Louise incredulously. Not Miss Grant's bonds? Nope, they're all there, safe. Pictures was taken down. Old pictures that must have belonged to the spirits when they was alive. That old desk in the corner of the dining room? The one that belonged to Miss Mattie's father was rummaged through and all the closets was upset, but nothing's missing. It looks as if somebody was searching for a will, remarked Jane. You know, the lost will you so often read about. There ain't no will in this house, Hannah stated. Miss Mattie give hers to Mr. John Grant to keep long ago. No, ma'am, it ain't natural what's going on here, and William and I are moving out. 
"'What's this? What's this?' interrupted the shrill high voice of the old lady. "'What are you gossiping about, Hannah? And to whom?' "'I'm just telling them two young girls, the ones that come here before, you know.' "'Well, never mind,' snapped the spinster. "'We haven't time to bother with them this morning. Tell them to run along and not to take up Elsie's time either. She's got plenty to do.' Jane laughed sarcastically. "'Somebody ought to teach that woman manners,' she whispered to Mary Louise. "'Serve her right if we didn't give her the money.' Her chum smiled. "'We couldn't be so cruel,' she replied. "'Besides, it wouldn't be honest.' She raised her voice. "'Miss Grant, we have some money for you.' "'Money? My money?' The old lady's voice was as eager as a child's. For the moment she forgot all about the pain in her side and came downstairs more rapidly than she had done for many a day. Both girls watched her in surprise. She looked different today, much younger. Instead of the somber old black sateen which she usually wore, she was dressed in a grey gown of soft, summery material, and her cheeks were flushed a pale pink. Her black eyes were alight with vivacity. "'You're not fooling me?' she demanded fearfully. Mary Louise reached into her blouse and produced the roll of bills. "'No, Miss Grant. We have eight hundred dollars here. Your money. The numbers on the bills correspond to the figures you gave me.' "'Where's the other fifty? asked the woman greedily. "'Did you keep it yourselves?' "'No, of course not. We don't know where it is.' "'But if you sit down, Miss Grant, we'll tell you our story.' The spinster reached out her hand for the roll of money and clasped it as lovingly as a mother might fondle her lost child. "'Come into the parlour,' she said, leading the way from the hall, "'and tell me all about it.' The girls followed her into the ugly room with its old-fashioned furniture and saw for themselves the chaos which Hannah had been describing. Instinctively, Mary Louise glanced at the windows to determine how an intruder could enter, for she did not believe Hannah's story of the ghosts. Although the shutters were half-closed, she could see that the catch on the side window had been broken, but everything in this house was so dilapidated that perhaps no one had noticed it. When they were all seated, Jane told the story of the previous evening's adventure, stressing the part that Silky had played at the end. Miss Grant was impressed and actually asked to see the wonderful little dog. Mary Louise replied that he was waiting for them on the porch. "'So it was Harry Grant after all,' the old lady muttered. "'I'm not surprised, but I still believe Elsie had some part in it and got the gold pieces for herself. She'd rather have them than the paper money. Oh, no, Miss Grant, protested Mary Louise. We're going to track them down, too. We want to go over to Harry Grant's now, if you'll write us a note of introduction and explanation. He may have the gold at his house. It isn't likely that he'd carry it around. Possibly. But I don't believe I'll write a note. I think I'll go along with you. I want to talk to that good-for-nothing nephew of mine myself, if he's home. And he probably is, since you got the money. Yes, and I'm going to put this money and my bonds in the bank. She hesitated a moment. If you girls get me back that other $50 bill, I'll give you a reward. We don't want a reward, Miss Grant, objected Mary Louise. If you'll just let us take Elsie with us to a picnic the young people in Riverside are planning, we'll be satisfied. I'll think about it, replied the woman. Hannah, she called. You go up and get my bonnet and a brown paper package that's underneath it in the box. I'm going to Riverside. "'You ain't a-gonna walk, Miss Maddie,' demanded the servant in horror. "'Of course I am. I haven't any car. John may not be over for several days.' "'But your side!' "'Fiddlesticks! Do as you're told, Hannah!' The girls hated to leave without seeing Elsie, but they knew that Hannah would tell her what had happened. Besides, they would probably return with Miss Grant. Perhaps they could get Norman or Max to drive them over. Jane chuckled at the idea of putting the old lady in the rumble seat, just for spite. Silky came darting up to them as they came out of the door, and Miss Grant reached over and patted his head. It's her one redeeming trait, thought Mary Louise, her kindness to animals. I'm glad you brought him, she said, in case we meet anybody like that man you encountered last night. They proceeded slowly, although the road was downhill. Every few minutes Miss Grant stopped and held her hand over her side. Mary Louise wondered what they would do if the old lady collapsed, and decided that Jane would have to run for a doctor while she and Silky stayed to protect her and administer first aid. But they reached the riverside bank without any such mishap, and Miss Grant attended to her business while the girls waited outside. Then, very slowly, they walked the three blocks to the home of Harry Grant. "'He is back!' exclaimed Mary Louise jubilantly as she recognized the battered old car in the driveway. "'I didn't expect he would be. I thought he'd stay away as long as that fifty-dollar bill lasted him.' "'Maybe he didn't have it,' remarked Miss Grant. Jane turned on her angrily. "'You think we kept that, don't you, Miss Grant?' she demanded. "'No, no, nothing of the kind.' 
Before they had mounted the porch steps, Mrs. Grace Grant had rushed out of her house in amazement and stood gazing at her sister-in-law as if she were a ghost. She was a woman of about the same age, but much pleasanter looking, with soft gray hair and a sweet smile. As Elsie had said, nobody could believe anything bad about Mrs. Grace Grant. "'Why, Maddie, this is a surprise!' she exclaimed. "'It's been five years at least!' "'It'll be more of a surprise when I tell you why I'm here, Grace,' snapped the other, sinking into a chair on the porch with a sigh of relief. "'I've got bad news. I've been robbed.' "'Robbed?' "'Yes.' In a few words the spinster told the story of her loss of thirteen hundred and fifty dollars, and of the two girls' offer of assistance in discovering the thief. "'Of course, I suspected Elsie immediately,' she said. "'But it seems I made a mistake. Or partly a mistake, for there is still five hundred missing, all in gold.' But these girls found out who took the bills and have got them all back for me, all but fifty dollars. Who is the thief? demanded Mrs. Grant excitedly. Your son, Harry. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Grace. I don't believe it, protested the other woman. What proof have you, Maddie? Tell the story, Jane, said Miss Grant. I'm too tired. She leaned against the back of her chair in exhaustion. Briefly, Jane related the incidents of the previous evening, describing their perilous ride in Harry Grant's car. The story rang true. Jane repeated the very words the young man had uttered as he drove away, words which Mrs. Grant recalled easily. Before she had finished, the unhappy mother was crying softly. "'What are you going to do to him, Maddie? she asked finally. "'Have him arrested?' "'That depends on him,' replied her visitor. "'If he gives me back the other bill, maybe I'll let him go. I don't want to drag the Grant name into the papers if I can help it. Is he home?' "'Yes, he's upstairs dressing.' Just getting up, eh? He was out late last night. Carousing with my fifty dollars, I suppose. I hope not. Mrs. Grant rose and went through the screen door. Five minutes later, she returned with her son. As Elsie had remarked, Harry Grant was a good-looking man. He was stylishly dressed in an immaculate linen suit, and he came out smiling nonchalantly at his aunt, as if the whole thing were a joke. Well, I'll be darned, he exclaimed, staring incredulously at Mary Louise and Jane. Are these the girls mother says I took for a ride last night? It's a terrible car, remarked Jane. Miss Grant stamped her foot to put a stop to what she considered nonsensical talk. Tell me how you managed to steal my money, Harry, she commanded, and where the other fifty-dollar bill is, and my five hundred in gold. The young man's chin went up in the air. I didn't steal your money, Aunt Mattie, he said. I was never inside your bedroom in my life, at least not since I was grown up. Don't lie, Harry. How did you get it if you didn't steal it out of my safe? It was given to me. By whom? Miss Grant looked scornful. She couldn't believe any such foolish statement. The young man hesitated. I don't think I ought to tell that, he replied. Oh, yes, you ought, and you have to, or I'll have you arrested, threatened his aunt. Tell the truth, dear, urged his mother. Whoever stole that money deserves to suffer for it. All right, I will. It was Corrine, my niece. Corrine Pearson. She took it. Eight hundred and fifty dollars in bills. She gave me eight hundred dollars, half of it to spend for her and half for myself. I was to buy a certain evening gown and cloak in a shop in New York with which she had been corresponding. With my four hundred, I was going to get a new car and drive back to Riverside and announce that I had a present for Corrine because I was sorry for her about the party and because I had put a good sale through. That's all. It simply didn't work. Corrine, repeated Miss Grant. I'm not surprised. I always did suspect her. And has she the other fifty dollars? Yes, I believe she kept that for slippers in the beauty parlor, answered Harry. Miss Grant got up from her chair. You surely haven't any of the gold, have you, Harry? She inquired. No, Corrine didn't say anything about any gold pieces. You can't use them now anyhow. No doubt she's keeping them put away, surmised the old lady. Come, girls, we're going to the Pearsons now. Can I drive you over, Aunt Mattie? Offered Harry jovially. I wouldn't put a foot in that rattle trap for anything in the world, was his aunt's ungracious retort. So she hobbled down the steps with Mary Louise and Jane beside her, and Silky close at their heels. End of chapter 8、Chapter 9 of The Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fifty Dollar Bill. The Pearson's home, an attractive house of the English cottage type, was half a mile from Mrs. Grant's, in the best residential section of Riverside. 
Mary Louise, noticing Miss Grant's increasing weakness, suggested a taxicab. The old lady scorned such a proposal. "'Use your common sense, Mary Louise,' she commanded in that brusque manner which Jane so resented. "'You know I've lost five hundred and fifty dollars, and now you suggest that I throw money away on luxuries like taxicabs?' "'I'll pay for it,' offered the girl. "'I have my purse with me.' "'Fiddlesticks!' The hot sun of the June day poured mercilessly down upon their heads as they made their slow progress along the streets of Riverside, but Miss Grant refused to give up, although it was evident that she was suffering intensely. When they finally reached the porch of the Pearson home, she almost collapsed. Corrine Pearson was sitting in the swing, idly smoking a cigarette when the little party arrived. She was a blonde, about nineteen years of age, pretty in an artificial way. Even her pose, alone on the porch, was theatrical. She rose languidly as her great-aunt came up the steps. "'Mother's inside, Aunt Maddie,' she said, ignoring the two girls completely. "'I'll go and tell her that you are here.' Miss Grant opened her eyes wide and looked sharply at Corrine. "'Don't trouble yourself,' she snapped, gasping for breath. "'It's you I came to see, Corrine Pearson.' The girl raised her delicately arched eyebrows. "'Really? Well, I'm honoured, Aunt Maddie.' There was nothing in her manner to indicate nervousness, and Mary Louise began to wonder whether Harry Grant's story were really true. "'You won't be when I tell you why I'm here, though of course you can guess.' Miss Grant paused and took a deep breath. "'It's about that money you stole from my safe.' "'What money?' The girl's indifference was admirable, if indeed she were guilty, as Harry Grant claimed. "'You know, eight hundred and fifty dollars in bills and five hundred in gold pieces.' Corrine laughed in a nasty, superior way. "'Really, Aunt Maddie, you are talking foolishly. I'm sorry if you have been robbed, but it's just too absurd to connect me with it.' "'Stop your posing and lying, Corrine Pearson!' cried the old lady in a shrill voice. "'I know all about everything. Harry Grant has confessed.' Mary Louise, watching the girl's face intently, thought that she saw her wince. Anyway, the cigarette she was smoking dropped to the floor but her voice sounded controlled as she spoke to her great-aunt. "'Please don't scream like that, Aunt Maddie,' she said. "'The neighbors will hear you. I think you had better come inside and see Mother.' "'All right,' agreed the old lady. Then, turning to the girls, she requested them to help her get to her feet. "'I'll help you,' offered Corrine. "'These young girls can wait out here.' "'No, they can't either. They're coming right inside with me.' Corrine shrugged her slim shoulders and opened the screen door. Her mother, a stout woman of perhaps forty-five, was standing in the living room, which opened directly on the porch. "'Why, Aunt Maddie!' she exclaimed. "'This is a surprise. You must be feeling better.' "'I'm a lot worse,' interrupted the old lady, sinking into a chair beside the door. "'Your daughter's the cause of it, too.' "'My daughter? How could Corrine be the cause of your bad health, Aunt Maddie? You're talking foolishly.' "'Don't speak to me like that, Ellen Grant Pearson.' Your daughter, Corrine's a thief, and she stole my money, out of my safe, night before last, when she went upstairs to get that old lace dress of mine. Impossible, protested Mrs. Pearson. You didn't, did you, Corrine? Certainly not, replied the girl. I think Aunt Maddie's mind is wandering, Mother. Send these girls home, and I'll call up Uncle John. He'll come and drive Aunt Maddie back to Dark Cedars. You'll do nothing of the kind, announced Miss Grant. "'There's not a thing the matter with my mind. "'It's my side and my breathing.' "'She turned to her two young friends. "'Jane, you tell them all about everything "'that has happened since I was robbed.' "'Jane nodded and again related the story, "'telling of their wild ride in Harry Grant's car, "'the capture of the satchel with the bills in it, "'and concluding with Harry's confession "'concerning Corrine's part in the crime. "'Mrs. Pearson leaned forward in her chair, "'listening to the recital with serious attention.' But her daughter acted as if she were bored with such nonsense and wandered about the room while Jane was talking, rearranging the flowers on the tables, and lighting herself a fresh cigarette. "'It isn't true, is it, dear?' asked Mrs. Pearson eagerly. Corrine laughed scornfully. "'It's just too absurd to contradict,' she replied. "'Uncle Harry made it all up about me just to save his own face.' She turned about and faced her great-aunt. "'You know yourself, Aunt Maddie, that if I had stolen that money, "'I wouldn't pay him four hundred dollars just to buy me some clothes in New York. "'It's all out of proportion.' "'Miss Grant nodded. She could see the sense to that. "'A hundred dollars would have been ample commission.' "'May I say something?' put in Mary Louise meekly. "'Certainly,' replied Miss Grant. 
The girl felt herself trembling as all eyes in the room turned upon her, but she spoke out bravely, disregarding Corinne's open scorn. "'I believe I can explain why Miss Pearson divided the money evenly with Mr. Harry Grant,' she said. "'It was a clever trick to throw the suspicion on him. Because you know, Miss Grant, if you saw him drive home with a new car, wouldn't you naturally jump to the conclusion that he had bought it with your money?' The old lady nodded her head. The idea sounded reasonable to her. "'And as for Miss Pearson's evening dress and cloak,' continued Mary Louise, "'if she didn't buy them in Riverside, you'd probably never know what she paid for them, or suspect them of being particularly expensive.' "'That's true, Mary Louise,' agreed Miss Grant. "'I'd never dream anybody would spend four hundred dollars for two pieces of finery.' Exasperated with the discussion, Corrine Pearson started towards the staircase. "'I'm not going to listen to any more of this ridiculous babble,' she said to her mother with a scathing glance towards Mary Louise. "'You'll have to excuse me, Aunt Maddie,' she added condescendingly. "'I have a date.' "'You stay right here,' commanded the old lady. "'I'm not through with you. You hand over that other fifty-dollar bill.' Corrine shrugged her shoulders and looked imploringly at her mother, as if to say, "'Can't something be done with that crazy woman?' Mrs. Pearson looked helpless. She didn't know how to get rid of her aunt. The situation was apparently at a standstill. Corrine Pearson wouldn't admit any part of the theft, and Miss Grant refused to allow her to go off as if she were innocent. But Mary Louise, recalling Harry Grant's explanation of the use to which Corrine had put that last fifty-dollar bill, had a sudden inspiration. She stood up and faced Mrs. Pearson. "'May I use your telephone?' she asked quietly. "'Why, yes, certainly,' was the reply. "'Right there on the table.' Again, all eyes in the room were turned upon Mary Louise as she searched through the telephone book and gave a number to the operator. Everybody waited in absolute silence. Hello, said Mary Louise, when the connection was made. Is this the Bonton boot shop? Yes. Can you tell me whether you took in a $50 bill yesterday from any of your customers? It seemed to her that she could actually feel the tenseness of the atmosphere in that room in the Pearson's house while she waited for the shop girl to return with the information she had asked for. Her eyes turned towards Corrine to see how the question had affected her, but Mary Louise could not see her face from where she was seated. In another moment, the voice at the other end of the wire summoned her thoughts back to the phone, and the answer was in the affirmative. So you did take in a $50 bill, Mary Louise repeated for the benefit of her listeners. Could you possibly read me the number engraved on it? Her hand trembled as she fumbled for her little notebook in which the notations were made, and Jane, guessing her intention, dashed across the room to assist her. When the sales girl finally read out the number on the bill, Mary Louise was able to check it with the one marked missing. It was the identical bill. "'Will you keep it out of the bank for an hour or two, in case we want to identify it, for a certain purpose?' she inquired. "'My name is Mary Louise Gay, Detective Gay's daughter. Oh, thank you so much!' She replaced the receiver and jumped up from the chair, squeezing Jane's arm in delight. She noticed that Miss Grant's black eyes were beaming upon her with admiration, and that Mrs. Pearson's were shifting uneasily about the room. Corrine was standing at the window with her back to the other people. Suddenly, she burst into hysterical sobs. Wheeling about sharply, she turned on Mary Louise like a cat that is ready to spit. "'You horrible girl!' she screamed. "'You nasty, vile creature! What right have you?' "'Hush, Corrine!' admonished Miss Grant. "'Be quiet, or I'll send you somewhere where you will be. Dry your eyes and sit down there in that chair and tell us the truth.' and throw that cigarette away. Frightened by her great aunt's threat, the girl did as she was told. I suppose you won't believe me now when I tell you that I didn't take any gold pieces, she whined. But that's the solemn truth. I admit about the bills. Begin at the beginning, snapped Miss Grant. All right. It was night before last, when Mother and I walked over to ask you for money for a dress. It means so much to me to look nice at the dance on Saturday night. I don't care what it means to you, interrupted the spinster. Go ahead with your story. Well, I thought it was pretty stingy of you not to help me out, Aunt Mattie, continued Corrine. But I never thought of taking the money till I went up in your room. How did you get the safe open? That's the queer part. It was open. I thought you had forgotten to close the door. Miss Grant gasped in horror. I never forget. Besides, I saw that the lock had been picked. Somebody did break it if you didn't, Corrine. There wasn't a bit of gold there, Aunt Mattie. I'm willing to swear to that. Corrine looked straight into the old lady's black eyes, and Mary Louise could see that her aunt believed her, 
and was already trying to figure out who else was guilty. No, you didn't have time to fiddle with a lock, she agreed. I can believe that. I think I was right in the beginning. Elsie must have stolen the box of gold pieces. Of course, cried Corrine in relief. That would explain it perfectly. An ignorant child like her would want only the gold. That's why the paper money and the bonds were untouched. Did you lose the bonds too, Aunt Mattie? No, they were still there. I put them in the bank today, with the eight hundred dollars these girls got from Harry Grant. Well, Corrine, you did give your Uncle Harry that money then? Yes, I did. For the exact purpose he told you about. Mary Louise sighed. They were right back where they started, with only this difference, that while Elsie had been suspected of the theft of the whole amount in the beginning, now she was thought to be guilty of stealing only the gold. But stealing is stealing, no matter what the amount, and Mary Louise was unhappy. Miss Grant grasped hold of the arms of her chair and struggled to her feet. She stood there motionless for a moment, holding her hand on her side. The flush on her cheeks had disappeared, her face was now deathly white. Both girls knew that she could never make that climb in the heat to Dark Cedars. "'You won't do anything to Corrine, will you, Aunt Mattie?' pleaded Mrs. Pearson fearfully. "'No, I guess not. Go get me.' Mary Louise expected her to ask for aromatics, to prevent a fainting fit, but she was mistaken. "'Go get me fifty dollars. What you have left of it, Corrine, you can owe.' But she could not complete her sentence. She reeled and would have fallen to the floor had not Mary Louise sprung to her side at that very second. As it was, Miss Grant fainted in the girl's arms. Very gently, Mary Louise laid her down on the Davenport and turned to Mrs. Pearson. "'Water, please,' she requested, but it failed to revive the patient. "'I think she ought to go to the hospital, Mrs. Pearson,' she said. "'There's something terribly wrong with her side.' Mrs. Pearson looked relieved. She had no desire to nurse a sick old lady in her house, even though she was her aunt. She told Corrine to call for an ambulance. It was not until two white uniformed attendants were actually putting her on the stretcher that Miss Grant regained consciousness. Then she opened her eyes and asked for Mary Louise. "'Come with me, child,' she begged. "'I want you.' The girl nodded, and whispering a message for her mother to Jane, she climbed into the ambulance and rode to the hospital with the queer old spinster. End of chapter 9